As we're talking here today, outside, ESCOM is busy load shedding because we're not able currently to meet demand. This unfortunate uh, reality in our lives reminds us of two things. Firstly, we're building the world's, almost the world's largest and most complex and sophisticated power stations, but they're not ready when we need them. And secondly, our electricity crisis, as a result of this build, has gone through the roof. We have the same problem with nuclear power. My talk today is not to talk about the details. I'm not going to cover the details of the costs that work that before me. I'm going to talk about why this happens. And that's the challenges of, and so my title is, the challenges of decision making under, under uncertainty. So, we do share a common objective, and it's useful to remember that. We would not want electric power that is clean, reliable, low cost, and produced with maximum economic spin-off for South Africa, as we've just heard. So this debate ultimately is not really about the merits of that particular technology. It, it is about how best to achieve our power system object, our objectives within its real-world context in South Africa, within our economic, institutional, social, political, and ultimately its human context. When we make power sector policy choices to achieve our objectives, it in effect amounts to making a very big investment decision. We have expected costs and we have expected benefits. But the problem is neither of these are, um, are certain. The future in reality is unknowable. And humans, as we sometimes forget, suffer from bounded rationality, as economists say. The challenge is therefore one of decision making under uncertainty and ignorance. So let's just think a little bit more about this. So we, we, the challenge is that we need to devise a strategy for allocating scarce capital resources in the face of uncertainty in order to meet our past supply objectives. So in simple terms, this amounts to choosing projects in the face of a highly uncertain future so that the returns and the benefits that they generate over time will be greater than their costs over time, including, importantly, the opportunity costs of the options not chosen because we've chosen a particular set of options. Central to this, to this challenge are the interrelated problems of uncertainty, asset specificity, and irreversibility. Once you build a power station, and you take the user up with risk because that asset is very specific to that application and, and that investment cannot be reversed. Further, an important point to this challenge is the insight that options have value. The greater the uncertainty, the greater the value of maintaining our options going into the future. <coughs> it's worth also thinking a little bit about what we mean by uncertainty. In typical new classical, traditional new classical economic writings, economists would model it as a risk. <coughs> risk is a situation like throwing a dice. You know exactly what the possible outcomes are, and you can assign very accurately the exact probabilities of every possible outcome. Unfortunately, in the world we live in, it, things don't work that way. Uh, a, a, a term that maybe is a bit closer to the realities that we face is something called technical uncertainty. Here, either future contingencies cannot all be known, or the probabilities cannot be objectively assigned. But we face actually a worse reality, and that is ignorance. Neither all the contingencies nor the probabilities are known. So we, we simply don't know what it is that we don't know. That is, that is what we're dealing with. This means that the problem is bigger than what we think it is, and is generally underestimated. And as I said before, humans suffer from bounded rationality. This means that we have a systematic inability to, com to comprehend the nature, scope, and scale of uncertainty about the future, and to adopt strategies that are appropriate to this reality. Let's get some real-world examples. We've discussed the theory. Let's get some real-world examples. In 2009, when the currently approves 2010 RP was being drawn up. The, the, the forecasters looked at a range of 
scenarios. They forecast the highest possible scenarios and the lowest possible scenarios and a range of options in between for what the norm might look like. When you look at this graph, you'll see, and this comes from the IRB 2010 update document, you'll see that within two years of doing those forecasts, we were at the lower bounds of the ranges that before that would seem to be plausible. And a year later, we were simply outside of the forecast ranges. Now, to be fair, we have to add that ESCOM has been constrained in its ability to supply, and that has had an effect on the levels. But I think most researchers in this field would agree, and we know that if you, the, the 2013 figures are even lower than the 2012 figures, and you're looking at more recent data, we are still at these very low levels. We will probably never be again in this cone of uncertainty that was forecast just a few years ago. R related to this is, is the forecast of energy intensity. Here we have the, 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 the same time. Here we have the same picture. Within two or three years, we were below the lowest possible forecast that was thought of at the time. So that, that gives you a feel for the range and the problem of uncertainty and ignorance about what the future might hold in terms of demand. That's just one factor. Let's look at costs. We've um, already referred to the Dubi and Kusili. And uh, the key point is, at the time, like we, the point where we're standing now for nuclear power, when we're talking about the possibility of investing and the numbers are being thrown around and we go to government to get cabinet approval, the message was, you know, it's going to be 50 billion, maybe 60 billion. What actually happens? In the end, you're talking about numbers that are two or three times higher. Irrespective of what are you do numbers. If you think I'm being unfair to talk about the degree, let's look at some other examples. Well, there's Kusili, as I've already said. There's Inga Gula, a less reported but equally problematic cost overrun. Well, in, before that, in the early 90s, there was Majuba. And so it goes back. Almost all of these very large power stations had large cost overruns. If you think I'm being unfair to talking just about ESCOM, we can look at the wider. Most recent large complex infrastructure projects in South Africa have had very large cost overruns. There's the Transcend new multi product pipeline, there's the Hard Train, the Hull Train Free Range Movement Project, the Inchalk International Airport, and the list goes on. And if this problem is not unique to South Africa, you can look around the world at these mega projects and you'll have the same problem. Interestingly enough, and here's a hint, and all of these projects that I list here, the state ultimately bore the final risk of these investments. The risk of the technologies chosen, the project configuration, the timing, and so forth. As I said, this problem is not unique to South Africa, and for instance, just one random example in the late 80s in California, a similar experience, a big investigation was done and the report was produced which said, in each case, unforeseen events radically changed the business environment, rendering the forecast invalid. In retrospect, we concluded that no one could have predicted with any degree of accuracy the nature or timing of this phenomenon. This is what we're dealing with. In, in broad terms, one can probably distinguish between two areas of uncertainty. The one is capital cost, building the project, building the power station. And the other one was, what, is what happens, the other area is what happens when you operate the plant. Both its reliability, its running costs, and importantly, the value of its benefits. If you build in a project, power station, a nuclear plant, um, the expectation that you are know, able to sell your power for 150 kilowatt hours to grab a number. And 10 years later, when your plant finally comes online, the alternative options can generate power for 90 cents an hour. The economics of your project is dead, and it's not viable, and you are costing society more than what you should have. Um, so, just to conclude this big problem of uncertainty and ignorance about the future, we've already discussed um, some of the trends around the model forecast, energy intensity, price response, and so forth. There are many other trends which you will be well aware of that could have huge impact on our power sector in the future. Decentralized power generation, renewables, higher in southern Africa, gas to power options, enormous possibility, smaller coal, coal fired uh, power generation, fuel switching, using solar heating, gas for heating, turning away from electricity where it makes economic sense, and also the role of carbon tax and so forth. So the point is if we know that our forecasts are going to be horribly wrong very soon. 
And we know that 15 to 20 years from now, 10 years from now, even 5 years from now, the world is likely to be a very different place in ways that we cannot yet imagine. Does long-term planning make any sense at all? Should you not rather face up to the realities of power nationality and the limits of planning and think differently about strategies for going into the future? A radical thought you might think. But the facts show that we are fooling ourselves if we think that we can do long-term planning because we simply cannot. If we need to think about this differently, how do we do that? Unfortunately, well, there are a lot of people that have been thinking about this problem. An interesting uh, author who did work on this in the, in the, in the 60s is called Charles Lindholm. He's actually a political scientist. He coined this phrase of the science of muddling through. His approach, was, uh, or basically incrementalism, his approach essentially pursues attempts at large scale rational comprehensive planning in favor of modest approaches that recognize the realities of bounded rationality and uncertainty. Yes, this approach poses a challenge to the mastery via understanding tradition of Western civilization, but it is an effective response to complexity and uncertainty in the context of modern rationality. That's the theory. It's a bit practical about what that means for the power sector. David Collingreach did quite a bit of work in this area, and he used the term flexibility of an investment or of a te technology choice. Flexible technologies are ones with lower complexity, shorter lead times, smaller unit sizes, lower capital intensity per unit of output, less dependence on dedicated infrastructure, and higher substitutability of its inputs, in other words, its fuels, mostly, but also other inputs. Why is this valuable? Well, there are a number of reasons, but two of them are that following a more flexible incremental approach, smaller investments, there's opportunity for trial and error learning. So rather than committing to a 9.66 gigawatt program of a particular technology, or even of uh, you know, a 4,000 megawatt power station, coal-fired power station, you, um, you pull 500, 400, 100 megawatt units, and you do it many times, and you can learn and improve. And the proof of this is what we've seen in our renewable energy program. We've seen the enormous reduction in costs and prices. To such an extent now that wind power is the cheapest power we can get in this country at the moment. If we had access to more hydro, that might be a good competitor. Not only does um, flexibility allow child and learning, but importantly, as we go into the unknowable future, it allows us to, be, to adapt to changing circumstances. We haven't committed everything up front. We're not stuck with a 100 year commitment. We can change. We can change tack. We value the ability to manage and to think on our feet and adjust to changing circumstances. Highly valuable. With inflexible technologies, ordinary mistakes lead to extraordinary consequences. But flexible, flexible technologies recognize that humans make ordinary mistakes and allows us to change tack when we need to. I'm going to rush. A further valuable part of a strategy going into unknown or uncertain future is the whole idea of diversity, not putting all your eggs in one basket. All of these strategies support and imply the idea that options have value and that inflexible strategies destroy options. So, does the large nuclear uh, in the program of large nuclear plant, how does that stack up against the challenges of uncertainty? Well, the proposal is 9.6 gigawatt program with all its associated regulatory fuel supply and spin fuel systems. But a smaller program will not have the economies or scale that they need. Clearly, this is the emphasis of a flexible program. <coughs> it, and more than that, it will displace and destroy other options. Because remember, these are exclusive. You, if you choose a big nuclear program, you are not choosing other things. It will, it will close partially making use of, of options that are emerging and will be available in the future in one form or another that will probably have higher value. And furthermore, right now, hydro and concentrated solar offer similar diversity benefits to nuclear at the current cost, and CSPDs is definitely likely to follow the same learning curve as some of the other new uh, technologies. So therefore, um, 
A large-scale nuclear program is not appropriate, it's not under the strategy for dealing with, 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 with the real world or the real world and uncertainty. Lastly, we have a concern about uh, ESCOM's financial constraints and we have this promise of a free lunch, right? Vendor financing, that's going to take our problem away. Uh, and we just have to sign power purchase agreements. Clearly, that is just a pipe dream. We will pay every single cent of the cost of nuclear power, irrespective of who finances it. Don't expect the Russians or the Chinese or the Europeans to come and give us aid money from for nuclear power. Right. Um, well, one question here is, what will happen if we run an equal bidding, open, transparent bidding process for nuclear for, for power, irrespective of the technology, and put all the risk, all of it, all of it entirely, onto the bidders? There are the institutional questions, I'm just going to run through them quickly. Uh, I doubt whether we've got the capacity and be concerned about the potential for uh, corruption. Lastly, there's the question of the nature of the debate. Um, IRP updates, irrespective of its status, clearly advises that we should be careful of prematurely committing to a technology that may be redundant, and there are just some uncertainties about the costs. In the, the National Development Plan, is similar um, warnings. But the chair of the Parliamentary Energy Committee is saying that IRP will not see the light of day, and the DOE is forging ahead with a nuclear program as if nothing has happened, and as if those policy, uh, highly detailed policy documents don't exist. We have to ask, have we abandoned rational debate and is nuclear becoming the new AIDS and denialism? So the conclusion is South Africa can do much better than investing in a large nuclear program. We need, we need large nuclear reactors like we need a man on the moon. It's impressive technology and it's great for ribbon cutters. Great for everybody involved in procuring, constructing, fueling, operating, maintaining the plants. And it's, but it's likely to inflict a fatal blow to electricity consumers and public finances and will lead to further deep into the industrialization in South Africa. Given the attractive alternatives we have, it is likely to come at a large opportunity cost to the economy. Therefore, my vote is no for new centralized nuclear power. Thank you.